So I sent the, ro the robot, pulled out the, uh, the the pressure plate and separated the components, but it couldn't get the, the, the jug out of the hard packed earth. And I want, if I could do it safely, I wanted to get as much evidence as I could. So I jumped out, did not have the bomb suit on, a uh, metal detector in one hand, I had um, my evidence kit in the other, and I started walking towards the device. And about 20 or 30 meters from the original device, there was a secondary that hadn't yet been found. Welcome to Combat Story. I'm Ryan Fugit, and I served war zone tours as an Army attack helicopter pilot and CIA officer over a 15 year career. I'm fascinated by the experiences of the elite in combat. On this show, I interview some of the best to understand what combat felt like on their front lines. This is Combat Story. Today, we hear one of our most inspirational combat stories from Aaron Hale, an Army explosive ordnance disposal tech who was blinded and badly wounded during an IED blast. Aaron later contracted meningitis and lost his hearing as well. You'll want to feel sorry for him and, if you're like me, yourself as well, but he truly has one of the most infectious and inspiring outlooks you're ever going to hear. Aaron started his military journey doing exactly what he always wanted to do by learning to cook as a Navy chef in Italy. After 9-11, however, he felt he wasn't doing enough to contribute to the combat going on in Iraq and Afghanistan. He made a deliberate choice to become an EOD tech, and it quite literally changed the entire course of his life. There was a point in time where his wife had to spell out every single letter of every word she wanted to say to him in the palm of his hand to communicate because he was, as he put it, trapped without the ability to see or hear. This episode took me through a range of emotions and tears. Aaron's story about the last time he got to physically see his son and his family before the blast reminded me of just how great so many of us have it in life and not to take it for granted. I hope this episode takes you through your own range of emotions and helps put some of your own problems that might not be so significant after all into perspective the way it did for me. Aaron, thanks so much for taking the time to share this exceptional story with us today. It's my pleasure and honor. Thanks for having me. And I think just because this is an audio visual uh, medium and podcast that we, that we share out, one of the, the important, I think, um, experiences we're going to go through is uh, obviously the challenges that you faced within EOD and the loss of sight and hearing. And here we are doing a podcast. Um, could you just share, um, as you have your own podcast, how, how do you accomplish this given some of these challenges that you face? You know, I've been asked this a lot. And for me, it seemed like it was just kind of a natural step uh, to say, you, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm blind, I'm deaf, except for the one cochlear implant. And everybody's asking, well, how do you stay so upbeat? And how do you do all these things? And I don't know. I had to I had to actually take a little introspective you know look into my life and try to figure out what it was and I believe it came you know there's a lesson learned it was described really well in uh, Sean Akers the happiness advantage uh, he's got there's seven principles for happiness and success in his life and uh, it was the, the the fulcrum and the lever and it the whole philosophy there is that you know people believe if you work hard and you're you become successful then you can then have earned happiness but it's just the opposite you know you are happy therefore you are successful and then you can work as hard as you feel or work to you know you know, you, know, you you can work as hard as you need so for me, when it when it came down to being being you know being blind, it was what's the next step for me? Of course, there were there's in the fact that even every day there are difficulties, there are tough times, and there are definitely low points. But I'm just not not wired that way. Whether it's my family and it's definitely you know military training, but. I I look at everything as a as a challenge as as an opportunity, and even when you know on my worst days, I would I would sit there and feel sorry for myself, 
and I, eventually like you can't can't rain all the time eventually i would just get bored crying into my my coffee and i would have to do something so if i'm going to be by be this blind deaf guy i'm going to be the best blind deaf guy i can be so i got out there and i started chasing the same dreams I wanted to. I chased more dreams. I chased bigger challenges than I'd ever even imagined beforehand. Because, of course, you've got that cliched second lease on life. Well, you know, it's, it, it, I was handed, you know, the reality check uh, on my own mortality. So I just got after it. I started challenging myself and finding out that I'm stronger, not despite my you know my difficulties but i'm stronger because of them and each time i found another challenge whether it was you know handed to me or if i was i chose it i became stronger after and happier because i challenged myself i, I just immediately feel so uh I think back to the times even recently where I'm like, oh, I've got it tough. And, and, you know, really, like, I'm so grateful for what you just said and the position you've taken. I know we'll get into a lot of this in the discussion, but um, the way that you motivate and inspire people is really incredible. And it just makes me personally reflect. I think, you know, you mentioned that you're not wired that particular way. And I want to ask about when you were growing up, if you would have had this same optimistic outlook. But just before I ask you that, Aaron, I would ask if for people who have been watching for the past few minutes, I mean, it looks like you're looking right at me, you're hearing me fine. Can you just talk through some of the logistics of how are you experiencing this podcast personally right now? You, uh, the kind of the way you set it up for me when we began. Well, I am... 100% blind. I didn't have my original eyes anymore. These are prosthetics. I hear they look like the originals, but uh, it's actually pretty funny. Uh, I, my tear ducts don't drain like they should. So every once in a while I get a little, little weepy. <laughs> uh, and it was funny. My, my wife and I, um, just to sidetrack a moment, my, my, my wife and I wrote our own vows and she promised to keep uh, the house stocked of bacon and bourbon. And I promised to never let my eye wander. And, <laughs> and uh, what I found out is when I wipe or you know, I have a scratch on my eyelid, I tend to twist my prosthetic around and it looks like I'm, you know, got a lazy, lazy eye. So while she's kept her promise, I have not been able to stick to my vows. <laughs> also, uh, uh, the the injury that said made me blind was in 2011. And it also cracked my skull in a few places where I was actually leaking spinal fluid right out of my nose. Uh, it took a couple of surgeries to patch it up. But four years later, come to find out that it had either not been completely patched or it had come open again and a path out is also a pathway in and i contracted bacterial meningitis which uh had stolen uh what was left of my hearing that the bomb blast hadn't taken so i was then in 2000 2015 plunged into total darkness and total uh, silence it took over six months before I could even have a chance to hear again with a cochlear implant, which is not a hearing aid. So it doesn't take the sound and amplify it, send it into the ear canal to just make things louder. My ears are completely turned off. I have no eyes, no ears. Wow. This is a magnetized tether that takes this takes that sound turns it into a digital signal and sends it into the implant which then has the electrode that goes into the cochlea the inner ear bone uh, and attaches to the auditory nerve so my brain literally had to learn an entire new way of deciphering the information it was getting 
and it takes it takes a long time so um uh if you imagine it's like hitting a bullet with another bullet they're they're mapping is what they call it. it's like tuning in I imagine they you know, all the highs and lows on the soundboard well they do that on the computer and uh every few weeks every month or so uh i would have to go back into audiology where they'd make some more tweaks and at the same time my brain is learning what it's hearing so to speak and it took the better part of a year before i could actually have a conversation with another human being so if you can imagine for the first six seven months of me just being trapped in my body like my whole world i did it at my fingertips of course that's when i was about that time when i thought man i should learn braille yeah <laughs> but, uh, but, um what's really cool and one of the upsides of having this cochlear implant that is, is bluetooth connected to uh, a microphone that you can actually it's this little lapel mic that i can hand over to my wife and she can secret service me you know in the uh <laughs> busy busy restaurant or something so she can yeah fulfill her life's dream of actually being like the voice of god in my head uh <laughs> but i plug that into my computer and i get the same audio pumped right into my cerebrum that you know you would have coming out of the speaker and that's how i use my my phone my computer it has a voiceover the text-to-speech software and i can do pretty more or less everything somebody else could do except look at pictures wow okay yeah thank you for sharing that just so that everybody has some context and uh, more of an appreciation for how great um, our own experiences can be in comparison and if, if we just look Aaron at your childhood that that question that that I'm wondering is did you have this like optimistic persevering outlook as a kid or did you develop it later? I think it was developed over time. I was always, um, I was a happy-go-lucky guy. I mean, definitely was. I grew up in you know, suburban Akron, Ohio. Had a great, great upbringing. My mom, the eternal optimist herself. Uh, yeah, it was just it, you know, football and wrestling and lacrosse and and just love to hang out with my friends. My high school experience was probably one of the some of the best years of my life. Yeah, I was not uh, a great student. I didn't have a whole lot of ambition, and I didn't have big goals at the time. I just was loving life in the in the present. Uh, but um, I think part of that was my mom's. Uh, uh, optimism and always looking at the bright side of course the other side of that coin not you're always living living in the um in the moment always being in the present is good but not having goals not having a whole lot of ambition or even much work ethic uh also paid its toll so i was missing a piece and uh, i did you know from time to time feel a little depressed yeah, especially because you know once i got to college all those people who learned you know knew how to work hard quickly passed me by and i tell people that i um was relieved of my duties as a student for cause uh, um, <laughs> the military description of of that yeah no uh, i just um I didn't, I didn't, didn't know how to focus on, on what was really important. And I, after about three semesters, both college and I decided uh, to part ways. And, and that's when I started looking for, you know, started looking for exactly what I needed was, you know, those core values, hard work, ethics, uh, you know, the, um, um, you know, having having goals, having drive towards something bigger than myself, uh, and it was funny. Be, 
about my entire life until about a month before I enlisted, I absolutely knew I'd never be in the military. <laughs> I, uh, wow. uh, I had lo- long hair, goatee. I was kind of a hippie kid, but um, definitely not much of a you know the rules and standards and guidance type of guy. Was it that got, that got fixed? Was that because some people could have this, I'm not going into the military because I just don't agree with that direction in life, or it's just like, that's probably not something I'd go into. I don't follow rules. Did you grow up with people in your family or in your circle of of friends or close relatives who were in the military, Aaron? Uh, I didn't have that much influence. In fact, I didn't have much interest in the military. It wasn't like I was anti-military service. Both my grandfathers served, but I didn't know either of them very well. My uh, my mom's dad died before I was born. And my dad's dad and my dad had a falling out a long time ago and didn't spend a whole lot of time with him. Didn't really get to know him. But one served in World War II, one in Korea, I didn't learn much about their stories for different reasons, but uh, I never had a negative impression of the military. It just didn't seem like my cup of tea until uh, I left college and I really got that reality check. You know, those catalyst moments in your life where I was just so embarrassed about my grades, about my performance that I really needed to change. And that's when I actually, my, my, my folks were divorced when I was about eight years old. Dad lived in California. I grew up with my mom and my, my two siblings in, um, in Ohio. And when I left college, I decided to pack up all my very, you know, all my worldly possessions, which are a whole lot when you're a college kid. And I uh, moved out to California with my dad, who, uh, very different than me, was a workaholic and very successful entrepreneur in his own right. So I figured I could learn from him. I actually got two jobs. I worked for uh, Hobie Surf and Sport during the day and uh, a restaurant and cooking because I love to I love to cook. I've been cooking since I could reach over the uh, the counter. My my whole family, my mom's side, very creative, artistic uh, people. My my mom and my brother, amazing paint and sketch artists. Uh, for me, that creative, I don't know, spark led me into the kitchen because I also love food. But uh, after about six or seven months of living in California and working two jobs, I still didn't have any money. It's California. <laughs> so um, that's when I decided that you know, like nothing was really changing. And I started looking for a way to get back to college. And since I'd been cooking, I thought, you know, at the time I'd become, you know, I'd go, go, go back to college. This time I'd go to culinary school and uh, the only problem was I I didn't have any tuition left. I wasted it on the first time around. And that's when I thought of uh, the military who would train me. I'd get a little OJT in cooking if I joined as a cook, a chef. Uh, and I could get that GI Bill and they'd send me to college. And in the meantime, I could also learn all about discipline and hard work and all that good stuff that I was lacking. Just a quick word from our sponsor, and we'll get right back to this combat story. As you know, I live in California, where we can have earthquakes and fires, and I grew up in Florida with hurricanes. I know firsthand how natural disasters can quickly and unexpectedly put me and my family in a position where we have to hunker down, shelter in place, and sometimes without power, so I always want to have food available. You can create your own stockpile of the best-selling Four Patriots Survival Food Kits. It's not ordinary food. We're talking good for 25 years, super survival food. Handpicked right in a family owned facility in the U.S., giving jobs to over 200 Americans, which we love. The kits are compact, sturdy, water-resistant, and stack easily. They have different delicious
nutritious breakfasts, lunches, and dinners, and you can make these meals in less than 20 minutes. Just add boiling water, simmer, and serve. And right now, you can go to 4 and use the code COMBAT to get 10% off your first purchase on anything in the store, including their three-month survival kit. You'll get their famous guarantee for an entire year after your order, plus free shipping on orders over $97. They're called 4 Patriots because a portion of every sale is donated to charities who support our veterans and their families. Just go to 4 and use COMBAT to get 10% off. That's the number 4, Patriots.com. Use the code COMBAT and start building your own stockpile today. And now, back to this combat story. So clearly, you have these two paths of the, the Navy experience, which is the first part as, as the cook, I believe, and then the EOD, which is a very different um, lifestyle altogether and OJT, if you will, when you went in that first time, it sounds like you wanted to go and be, be a cook. Does that sound like, is that what, when you went into the recruiter's office, that's what you were asking? Absolutely. Uh, first it was, you know, what a branch, right? What do I even start looking? And I had no idea about all the opportunities each branch offered or the diff- the, how vastly different besides just their uniforms, uh, each branch work. I just figured I didn't want to be one of those guys with a rifle in the jungle or the desert, you know, didn't didn't want to be infantry. So that kind of automatically for me ruled out the army and the Marines. And I don't know, there's something about the Air Force. It just didn't, I don't know, that was like I had didn't Billy literally did not know anything about the Air Force except airplanes. And nah. so it was the Navy and you had that the awesome Navy recruiting commercials uh, when I was a kid about let the adventure begin and see the world and uh, all the romantic, uh, you, you know, romanticized um, stories about being in the Navy and seeing the world. So uh, I joined the Navy. I took the ASVAB. I did pretty well, I, I imagine, uh, on the ASVAB because they wanted me to become a tech, a nuke tech on a submarine. Wow. And I said, absolutely not. I saw K-19, man. I want to be the cook. I'm going to be a chef when I get out in four years. So I might as well do the OJT. You know, I might as well work in the, my chosen profession and I had, I, I had no um, misconceptions about what I would be doing in the meantime, you know, cooking in a big, you know, mess hall on, on a carrier or something. I said, I'll put, I'll put in my dues. That's fine. I'm going to go to culinary school. And, you know, at MEPS, they were, said, are you sure? <laughs> they, I guess you don't get any bonuses for signing on cooks, but uh they uh, let me co- enlist as a uh, mess management specialist, which later was changed to culinary specialist because I guess the previous name was just a mouthful. And uh, my, I went to the Navy's A school and I was, I was, I was, I was I actually had a great time though. Navy's cooking school is about 90% how not to kill somebody you know sanitation <laughs> standards and cleaning standards and all that kind of stuff and then oh by the way here are these recipe cards don't deviate uh, but uh, somehow i i got top of my class in in, in the in the, you know, the navy's mismanagement school and the way the Navy ha- does orders is that each class of about 25 or so gets a stack of orders. And to, by class rank, you get your pick. So I got my pick of 25 different orders. And one of them was flag mess in Naples, Italy. It was actually wow. you know, a- Admiral's chef. And it was a fluke. But they needed they needed a, a young seaman in the you know the flag mass. And then everybody, all the other orders got handed out. <laughs> Two days later, the senior chief in in the school calls me in and goes, sorry, seaman hail, but manpower came back and they they changed the that billet to an E5. Oh. 
Yeah, so they took those orders away and I said, well, where am I going? What do I do? And it was it was almost like the senior chief started pulling out drawers and his desk to see, to find out where he was going to send me. Like, do I have another set of orders around here? And he said, how about a minesweeper in Corpus Christi? And I didn't know at the time, but it's those are those are small, small ships, small crews. And those cooks actually do get some leeway, some freedom to be very creative. I didn't realize that and didn't sound like a, you know, a reward for being top of my class. So I said, what, what else you got? He goes, I've got, you were going to go to Italy. I've got shore duty in Naples, Italy. You want to go there? I'm like, yes. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> yeah. Does the Pope wear a funny hat? But uh I get off the plane, sea bag in hand, and I get to uh, the NSA Naples, Capitacino, and then, you know, you know, one of the you know the senior cooks there, you know, my sponsor meets me, and I said, "Where where am I going to be uh, cooking?" They're like, "No, no, uh, you we only cook on board ships. On on shore duty, we run the barracks." Uh-huh. What? <laughs> yeah uh it's like the navy's version of hotel restaurant management <laughs> so i because i was the fng i was put uh for six months i was put on the night shift at the front desk of the beq no yeah so i was i was taking trouble call tickets i was uh you know i was helping you know, and drunk sailors from the uh, the base bar, you know, with lost keys and that kind of stuff, lockouts, uh, uh, handing out, you know, the the trash bag, you know, full of clean linen to each new check-in, that kind of stuff. And it was uh, excruciatingly boring. But uh, I worked my way up to the maintenance department. <laughs> and uh, for the, the rest of the time I was there, in in naples i uh, escorted all these italian local national public works guys through on those trouble calls throughout the you know the barracks and i would uh, talk with the contracts guys and we'd all hang out at the little cafe pagoda right outside the bar you know the barracks and i'd have like 15 espressos throughout the day and everywhere we went i would go como se dice and i'd point at this como se dice como, how do you say this and how do you say that and i was learning italian well, albeit i was learning neapolitan italian from a bunch of neapolitan roughneck plumbers and electricians <laughs> so yep. it's it was pretty shoddy book italian but uh, it soon, it, it, as soon as I got off duty, I would go out and become a local. I loved the culture. I loved the food. I loved everything about Italy. It was, it was an adventure. And I think there was another, uh, a, a, another example of um, that happy disadvantage or the, the optimism. Because, you know, you have those uh, service members that are just disappointed that wherever they go isn't as isn't the same as home and you have those barracks rats yeah the the, the people that never yeah. want to leave base because the outside world is nothing like i'm used to and you know these people are rude and you know i don't i can't, I can't find my you know i don't have a tgi fridays and that kind of stuff <laughs> so i don't feel like i would loved it out there i didn't want to go i didn't want to go to work no but you know, when my two years there was up lo and behold a flag duty billet did open up and i was the right rank for it so a pcs to guy to italy just 45 minutes away and i got that that flag mess job and i got wow. to cook for the commander of the u.s sixth fleet three star vice admiral and i got to do some real cooking and i also sailed around the mediterranean in the uss la salle uh seeing the mediterranean you know going to visit all these different countries uh near uh, you know italy running up the flag throwing a reception for dignitaries and royalty and all that and then off duty you know in port it was great because i was um 
Inport is just a floating office building and nobody wants to stay after close of business. So I would go in nice and early, make breakfast, I'd make lunch, I'd clean up, hang up my uniform and buy, you know, by 1400, I was an Italian. I was gone because okay. nobody's sticking around for dinner. Did out at out at sea because we had a small crew. We paid you know paid our dues. You know we would uh, do uh, breakfast, lunch, dinner, and set out something for mid rats for the you know the higher ranking uh, watch standers. But um, in port, I, you know, I, I get off of yeah you know, get off of work right as Riposa was kicking off, so everybody was napping. But yeah. Yeah, it was it was an amazing experience. I let me had, add, had let me ask you this, Aaron. So, like, I, I'm kind of just jealous of that experience. My first assignment was in Germany, and I had lived overseas growing up in like Africa and the Middle East. But like, I just really, really enjoyed Germany. And I have a nephew who's at Vicenza now in Italy, and like, uh, Italy is just such an amazing place. I ended up living um, in France for a while as well. I have to imagine that if you if you love cooking, Italy has to be one of the top places on anyone's list to just live, to just be in that environment. Like how much did you, even for those first two years, just on that maintenance side of things, as you were getting out and being an Italian, how much did you learn about cooking from just osmosis? You know, what I did learn while uh, in Italy and then just my time aboard uh, the, 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 you know, the flagship and with other actual chefs in, in the flag mess is that yeah, different regions, different cuisines, it's about cooking style. It's not about ingredients so much as how a culture prepares food. So for and and also what i learned is that italy is actually a younger country than the united states uh they used to be all these much smaller city states regional countries basically so you go you don't you don't go to florence for a pizza you go to naples right and uh I would go touring around you know driving an hour or two and be in a completely different culture uh, cuisine culture and it was it was it was like dis discovering something new every single day yeah. uh, and one of the biggest things for me coming from america where we process our, our food a lot we preserve it uh, quite a bit is that most of italian cuisine it's all about freshness simplicity and how you prepare it but everything is fresh. And just this out of curiosity, because so many of the people I've interviewed have been going in, like looking to do that combat arms work in the military. And then a recruiter might say, all right, I need you to go be a cook first. They're not looking for that route necessarily. When you're in that environment, like when you're in Italy, you're, you're actually cooking. How many of the other sailors in in that job their their desired outcome later in life is to be a chef like that's why they joined up to do that you know i never got the the job yeah you know, i never never got the experience that 99% of the navy's cooks get i went from the barracks to flag mess and I never got what I was expecting, the big ship's staff uh, mess, the big mess, where you're cooking in those steam jacketed kettles that are like the size of a Volkswagen. Uh, <laughs> I never got that experience. And so, so but I did, like the, the barracks duty wasn't, wasn't the most fun. But... When I did get to the flag mess, I was cooking for the Admiral. Those guys were there because of their previous experience. Uh, I don't know how I snuck in, but there were a couple guys that had been to culinary school. At least one of them used to be uh, a chef in Las Vegas. And 
just I guess he had too much of the nightlife scene himself and needed to clean out and clean up a cleanse but, uh, yeah yeah but uh I, I I I learned a lot from these guys and it was it was great to experience both it both both learn from these guys who had the the uh, traditional training, the education, but it was also a great learning experience on board the ship where we had limited resources. It's not like you can just go out to the grocery store or you know the Whole Foods or the Fresh Market or something, some specialty, um, um, especially grocer to pick up those fine ingredients. We had to get creative with what. Every, everybody had on board the ship, the ship stores. We would have our own budget. So when we were back in port in Italy, we would stock up on what we could, but we only had so much um, storage and refrigerator space. Uh, so when in 2000, say 2002, uh, I'm trying to think when, when both, I think it was when Iraq kicked off and um, we, we were out at sea for 54 days straight. Even my 17-year senior chief of the, the, the flag mess said he'd never been out at sea for this long, you know, continuously. And we were really getting creative with what we had on hand. We did an un underway replenishment, an unrep, but it's the basics, right? Um, we, we, these guys, of course, were, were really, really creative with what they had. We still held our standard for making fine food, but, uh, you know, we just had what we had. Got it. So it, in a second, I'm going to try to understand how you make the change from chef to EOD tech. But one question, burning question that I have, I am um, making a documentary for combat story where I'm re-interviewing 10 to 12 guests. And one of the questions I'm asking them is of all the time they served, which branch has the best food? And the, the answers I'm getting are almost universally the air force. However, any one of these guys who, or gals who has eaten in like a, a flag officer type environment in the Navy is quick to point out that that is incredibly good dining experiences. Like whether they're Delta guys and just had a chance to be in that in that environment with the more senior folks on a ship, they tend to say like that is hard to hard to beat. So is there is there any rivalry between kind of the Navy, Air Force, the different branches as it comes to cooking? Any thoughts from your perspective, having been in the trenches there, so to speak? Absolutely. I mean, there's definitely rivalry. And I think that's just inherent among the branches, no matter what the job is. But then there are interdisciplinary rivalries as well. So uh, when it comes to who's got the best chow, I might have to agree with Air Force it, uh, overall, because I think they just spend more money on their bases they don't have to you know keep a you know floating fleet alive and True. and all of that and they they do have good chow halls but then they also their e uh, equivalent uh, as an enlisted job is services and those are the 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 personnel that they put in their their dining facilities are also the same personnel that hand out basketballs at the gym you know, all those services. Right. So they're not, it's not the enlisted folks that are in, for the most part, doing the cooking. It's the, it's civilians, uh, civilian contractors that cook at their chow halls. It's the same for, I think, all the branches when you're on, on land. Uh, but when you get down to sea, that's when you get, you get, you know, like, the Navy, who, who are the only ones going out to sea, um, are the, the the cooks. And I think they get, I, mean, I don't have much uh, by way of experience when it comes to 
marine cooks, <laughs> but um, I have seen and participated in uh, some culinary uh, challenges. The army can hold its own. And, wow, uh, I'm surprised. But, but I tell you what, what um, I always think of, and, and you, can, I don't think you can um, really, you know, com you can't really compare the, the those flag, you know, the the flag um, cooks. They're kind of in a world all of their own, and it's the navy navy chefs that cook on board Air Force One, cook at the White House and at Camp David. Um, uh, but one of the things that stands out to me the most are the night bakers aboard every ship uh, when everybody else is in their racks and there's only the night watch or like night you know, patrols and flights and all that. There's the night bakers. And the, I just... I just remember the dinner rolls were just the most amazing thing I'd ever eaten. That's awesome. And it was so good. Okay. Um, thank you for answering that. I had not even considered it. And the fact that it's Navy chefs who are cooking at those, um, you know, the white house and air force one and that sort of thing. I think that says a lot right there. So curiosity here, where does the, the army EOD path come in. Why do you go down that direction? Well, like I mentioned, um, 2000, 2000, uh, 2004 was when I was on board uh, the flagship. And all of a sudden we found ourselves, you know, I, I, I enlisted in September 99 at, when we were at peace. And in four years, we had two wars going on and the ship went out to sea as a flagship. It kind of did its figure eights in its box uh, out in the Mediterranean. And we were fighting a war out there. And yes, every, every service member has his, his or her role and every job is important. I was still, you know, part of the mach big machine the war fighting machine but i was i was watching the war on on the news so i knew it was going on in fact you know you hear things you on board you know the center you know the, the, the flag you know the you know the headquarters of the entire uh atlantic fleet and but I didn't feel like I was really a part of it. And I definitely didn't feel as though my, my skills, my talents, my, my, my abilities were being put to, you know, the, the, the best, you know, the, the best capacity they could be. And I'd been in the service for four or five years at this time. I'd already extended to, to get this flag cooking billet. And I'd, I'd actually uh, got, gotten, you know, advanced, you know, promoted uh, more quickly than my peers and also done exactly what I'd intended by learning how to become a hard worker you know, and have that, that work ethic and take pride in what I was doing. And above all else, it became less about those selfish uh, pursuits and more about serving serving my country serving um you know the war fighting effort you know something much bigger than myself and more most especially it was about serving my brothers and sisters in arms and i just i just wanted to do more but so my i, I got orders uh and my time in italy was up and they sent me to uh, Newport, Rhode Island, and then back to a barracks. <laughs> and I thought, oh, man, not more of this. So uh, at the time, they were, they were asking for volunteers to go work on the provincial reconstruction teams out in Afghanistan, PRTs. And they needed some cooks. 
So I volunteered. They said I could do a six month rotation uh, in Afghanistan and then I could come back and finish my time in Newport. And I volunteered and they said, congratulations. And then uh, a few days later, it was just like uh, the Navy cooking school. A couple of days later, they said, no, no, never mind. We don't need you. I had just called my entire family and told them the bad news that I was deploying, even though, you know, when I enlisted, my mom, <laughs> nobody, nobody had known, nobody had seen that coming, right? My dad actually chortled when I told him I was enlisting. He's like, really? My mom, of course, was very terrified. I said, mom, I'm joining the Navy. It, battle's going to be, you know, on, fought on, on land. And I'm a cook. I'm not going to be, you know, going, I'm going to be cooking. Even if there's a battle, I'm just going to be cooking. And then here I am volunteering for service, you know, de de deployment to the desert. And much closer to uh, the fight. So um, it was a surprise to everybody. So I, I, I called everybody and told the whole family what's going on. I'd only be gone for six months. I'll be back. I'm still going to be a cook. And as soon as I finished all those phone calls, which were difficult, I get I get a call from my chief who says, oh, never mind. No, we didn't need you to find somebody else for that billet. Okay. Made some more phone calls. Just kidding, everybody. You know, I'm staying here in Newport, Rhode Island. You know, I'm going to be at the desk at the, you know, the barracks. I'm going to be nice and safe at the Navy War College. And, and then it was just another 24 hours later, I get an email that says, congratulations. You've been selected to uh, deploy to Afghanistan for 12 months. What? <laughs> so made some more phone calls and... Uh, went off and trained how to be trained how to be a pseudo soldier first. They sent uh, all these Navy and Air Force PRT uh, individual augmentees to Fort Bragg, and we did like the basic training type thing: throw grenades, shoot uh, rifles, and um, uh, land navigation, that kind of stuff. Gas masks. And it was it was like. You know, for the Navy guys, it was like going to camp or something. I don't know. Um, but, um, it had, I've actually really enjoyed it. I loved loved that kind of stuff. I loved shooting the rifles and getting qualified. And, um, you know, the, when I went through Navy basic training, it was it was it was like a glorified version of duck hunt not even ammunition. You just click and a laser hit a target. And you're like, all right, get out of here. Uh, but I uh, trained up, went to Bragg, then I went to Afghanistan, and we were in uh, PRT, we were in Fab Farah, way out west, or is that, wait, way out east? Yeah. Uh, oh, way out west, no, right. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, it was in the middle of nowhere. Even the town were like, nah, you can have it. So for an entire year, we were pretty bored, but while I was out there, you know, cooking, um, and it went from, you know, the admiral's mess to, you know, I was cooking for maybe 35, 45 of his top brass to, I had, a, a um, in for Afghanistan, I had one other Navy cook with me and nine local national Afghan cooks. And we served 300 to sometimes six or more, 600 or more ISAF troops just depended on who was rolling through and uh so it was definitely kind of a shock but uh while i was there i met a few eod technicians they they had you know their armored truck the jerv and they had one day they were doing uh, uh maintenance on all their gear you know making sure everything's clean, making sure everything's functional, new batteries and charges and all that. And they had their bomb suit and their robots and all this other stuff just out in the parking lot. And it was like a, like a, like a cool guy yard sale. And I started, you know, like started a conversation with these guys, learned all about the job. I thought bomb squad in the military, that that's awesome. 
is they asked me if I wanted to go on, uh, you know, they had some stuff they needed to get rid of. If I wanted to go on one of their controlled detonations, like, do I? And they even let me pop it off. So, man, I was hooked from there. Uh, the the combination of the Titan of Brotherhood within the military, the technical aspect of the job, and the fact that you're a first responder, a lifesaver on the battlefield, everything just kind of linked up and the stars aligned, and I knew that's what I needed to do. I enjoyed cooking, but I knew this is what I was called for. So I put in a request with the Navy to go from culinary specialist to EOD, and they promptly denied me. <laughs> I, <laughs> I guess they like my cooking too much. But uh, the truth was, um, for one, at the time, the Navy didn't, uh, the Navy's um, EOD weren't, it wasn't a rate it was it was a it was a qualification. So you had to come from certain source rates like bosun's mate or mastered arms. Just no, there's no such thing as a cook EOD qualified. Uh, that would actually in the same year would change and they would become an EOD rank or rate. But also culinary specialist uh, E5, which I was at the time, was undermanned, and the next rank up was overmanned. So I wasn't getting promoted. I was. They didn't want me to leave the job because they didn't have enough um, petty officer second class. I was stuck and I wasn't going anywhere for a while. And so when I came back from Afghanistan, my contract, uh, my enlistment was also coming to an end. And I had to decide if I was going to re-enlist or not. And I just took my service record over to the army recruiter. And I said, hey, I want to go EOD. They said, welcome. And I signed up. Got to keep my rank, so I went from petty officer second class to uh, sergeant. Right. And I trained, I changed uniforms, I trained up to be a soldier, then they, then I got sent to EOD school. So Aaron, just for people, we, we really haven't had a true EOD tech on before. Um, we've talked to people who have in lieu of not having that type of EOD support have had to go out and, and kind of lead and look for different IEDs or threats in a similar manner, but not somebody who's been trained on it. Could you set the context for our listeners in terms of like, what is the job set for EOD and what that training is like? Uh, explosive ordnance disposal or EOD techs are the military's bomb squad. Now the guys that get in the that bomb suit, that big green thing with a bubble helmet, and they make that long, lonely walk towards anything that blows up, from bullets to flares to fireworks, all the way up to uh, nuclear weapons and WMDs. We do bi chemical, biological, radiological, uh, old World War II cannonballs. Everything that goes boom, that's in our wheelhouse. So the training is pretty intensive. We've got to maintain physical fitness, of course, be, a, you know, to be able to operate in the bomb suit in non-permissive environments. And that thing gets pretty hot pretty fast. But even as important, or maybe possibly more important, is... Um, the technical aspect, like I mentioned, is all oh, we have to learn. Uh, we, we, it actually starts right back uh, with the basics, uh, basic electronics, physics. Yeah, how do these things operate when they're fired? What kind of forces uh, do these things undergo when being dropped or thrown or shot or buried? How do they? How do they go off? How do they sense when it's time to go off? And how do we recognize what's what? You know, how do we know when one goes off when it's stepped on or when one needs a little more weight because it's you know designed to take out a tank or a vehicle? It, it, so and there's so much, so much that goes into it. 
uh, the EOD school has a very high attrition rate. And you know, the a passing uh, passing score is an 85. That's that's a minimum passing score. Because you don't want an EOD tech that got C's throughout, you know, his school. And there are many uh, test questions or hits in in the schoolhouse that are worth 16 points because one mistake will kill you. In fact, over the gateway to the practice area, there's our motto that says uh, initial success or total failure. Yep. Kind of drives wow. the point home. And did you, it sounds like, although challenging in that type of schoolhouse, it, it just, I can, it, it seems like I can feel that you enjoyed it. The, the learning, the experience. Loved it. I loved it. <laughs> I felt at home, but I was also, I had to hit the ground running because I didn't have the uh, benefit of coming up EOD from, from a, uh, uh, you know, private and I was coming and as a sergeant and as a sergeant and especially as a staff sergeant, which would be coming up very soon because just my you know, time in service, I'd be promoted very quickly. I was expected to become a team leader very fast. So I had to learn not just the job and what they, they tell all of the EOD students is that just getting through the EOD school teaches you how to learn how to be an EOD tech. Uh, so I'll, even more of your education happens on the unit level. And I needed to be, I needed to be even better. I needed to be faster because I'd be expected to be the one that actually go, gets in the suit. The highest ranking guy on a team is the team leader. And he's the one that suits up and goes down uh, on, on those IEDs, those unexploded ordnance. And um, I needed to get ready even faster. Didn't be, so there was a lot of pressure. Um, so immediately, as soon as I graduated the schoolhouse, I be, started my team leader certification process. And while there was a lot of pressure, I, I, I mean, I was, I was enjoying going to work, I, you know, kicked off the, the sheets every morning and jumped into my uniform and I, I just couldn't wait to start the day. And that has a lot to do with the kind of, kind of people, you know, that go into the field, the people I was working with, you know, the, you know, those brothers and sisters in, in like, like the special forces or other units that are really tight and <laughs> always trying to kill each other. Oh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, because we're into, you know, IEDs and that's our job. We're always planting fake booby traps. Our, we're, we needed to be able to defeat any kind of IED that might be out there. And IEDs are limited only by the bad guy's creativity. So we had to be more creative. <laughs> and so we, we would rig all sorts of things around the, the, the team shop uh, connected to um, sirens, to airsoft, um, airsoft grenades, um, to uh, tasers. <laughs> um, so if you, if you were uh, killed uh, by a fake ID, you knew it, but it always kept us on our, our toes and it always made for great stories later. Wow. So uh, I want to ask about the first time that you found yourself doing this job downrange, but just before that, for context, and please correct me if I'm wrong here, Aaron, I have to imagine timing wise, it sounds like we're probably somewhere around 2006, seven, eight IEDs are evolving rapidly in theater at that time. I mean, mm -hmm. there's like a counter IED task force. It's just trying to understand um, we're building um, equipment, trucks to withstand much larger 
um, IEDs. So that, that innovation that you talk about, the enemy is evolving rapidly. They're innovating. I have to imagine one of the skills you need is you have to be pretty innovative, not just once you get to the to the bomb, but like, how do you find it to begin with? There's got to be a lot of of innovation required on the tech side too. Well, that was part of the training, and that was it was it was all about the basics. the The fundamentals will always be there, and I think that's that's true for any any job. Uh, so long as you know the the basic fundamentals you're on the right path. And of course, back CONUS and stateside, we were always getting the latest reports from you know, the SIPRNET. We were always getting the latest, uh, uh, latest reports on the new developments on the battlefield. And we would study them and we would practice them so that when we got there in theater, we were prepared for everything we'd seen so far. Wow, it, uh, it's a, it's it's a lot to keep up with. Um, not just learning all the hundreds of thousands of different types of munitions that all these different foreign countries have devised and might be in our area of operation, but how they can transform these things into IEDs. And where where do you go for your first deployment? I went, my first deployment was in 2010 to Iraq. And I was, I was a team sergeant and most EOD teams uh, in the army at least are three member teams. You had a team leader and two, uh, uh, a team leader and two, two team members. And I was the fourth on this team as a sergeant trying to learn from a ex more experienced team leader so that I could then move on to, you know, once I completed my team leader certification, I could be a team leader myself. But it was kind of like being a third rail. Uh, I, you know, the, these three uh, EOD techs had been a, a team for a good long time. And I stuck out like a sore thumb. Uh, there wasn't a whole lot of you know, cohesion. Uh, at least I, I didn't really meld with them uh, right away. So I think what, it was great of my uh, platoon sergeant and my first sergeant to recognize what was going on and uh, really threw me a lifeline. In fact, it was the best thing I think that could have happened to me was they reassigned me over to um, Jido and the uh, counter explosives exploitation exploitation cell or sexy over at task force troy <laughs> and that's uh yeah they have great t-shirts but uh uh went to task force troy and uh did i, I did triage for the the sexy cell and what that is is of course eod techs on the battlefield not only do they you know they detect, diffuse, and dispose of these UXOs and IEDs, but we also uh, collect as much ev evidence as we, we possibly can safely and send it up as we're, we're like the CSI on the battlefield. We try to get you know, information from these IEDs so we can get left of the bang. So if you can imagine on a timeline, boom, we'd find the bomb emplacer, the bomb maker, the supplier, the financier, all those guys, and follow the chain backwards. So I went to where uh, they were processing the, 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 the intel. So triage is where they receive all the IED components from the battlefield. And then it gets um, organized, photographed, and measured and all that and separated to go off to the different departments like uh, chemical analysis, electronic biolog uh, biological analysis, all that kind of stuff. So we get the fingerprints and we get the chemical analysis from the uh, explosives and all that. And I learned exactly how all these uh, entities wanted it because once it goes 
from triage to these different uh, departments and studied. It then with the EOD text from the, the, the battlefield storyboard goes off to CIA, DEA, uh, FBI, and DIA, and all those other intel uh, you know, entities that want to know what's going on. And it turns into those reports that we read back on the uh, you know, stateside. And I was right there at the junction from where it came off the battlefield and then went, went on, got processed. So um, I learned so much about how it was supposed to be presented. And when I got my own team, I knew how to, how to properly bag it the right in, in and analyze it or how they were going to analyze it. And, and it was, a, it was a great learning experience. And where where do you end up with that first team? Is that also Iraq? Yeah. I'm sorry, what was that? Where do you end up with that first team of yours? Is it is it in Iraq? <clears throat> is it in Afghanistan? When I got my first team? Yes. Uh well I uh when I became team leader and got my first team, uh we were sent to Afghanistan. So I was a little west of Kandahar in the Zaraid district. Um, that's like, that's the birthplace of the Taliban. It was one of the last strongholds uh, of resistance in 2011. Wow. And this is where, this kind of place that uh, the Russians used to call the heart of darkness. And my team supported the 4-4 Cav Scouts out of Riley. Uh, and a little town called Sia Choi. And I, I asked uh, a Terp uh, once, what does Sia Choi mean? He goes, I think that means a cemetery. I'm like, great, we're in Tombstone. Wow. And that's it's kind of like, it, that. that's kind of how it felt. Everything was blowing up. Uh, the the uh, route clearance engineers were losing a truck every other day. Um, there was just, there were IEDs everywhere. They were always the same thing, almost always, a the pressure plate and a oil jug of HME. And uh, we were busy. We kept busy all the time. We were doing helicopter inserts. We were doing dismounted patrols. We were all over the place trying to win minds and hearts. And at the same time, I was doing, uh, I, was, I, was, I was digging up IEDs. I was doing post blast analysis, which is never fun. Uh, that's when you get there to the right of the bang. Wow! And it was just my team was uh, was definitely doing sort of trial by fire, and we worked uh, very hard. For I was there eight months and change out of a twelve month ro rotation, and. Aaron, if you can, how frequently would you be encountering some type of explosive? Is it is it daily for the team or post-explosive as you described it? Is it maybe once a week? Is it several a day? What's the volume that that looks like? Um, it seemed like it was every day, but it really wasn't. We'd have our downtime. Um, but I think in the eight months... We were there. Must have. I definitely ran uh, over fifty IED missions, and sometimes the one mission uh, or one IED encounter had multiple IEDs. Uh, so I had to process one at a time until the, all the hazards were clear. Can you share with us the first time you had to go out and face an IED, whether it was with that initial team you described in Iraq, or if it was with your team in Afghanistan, just the first time you had to go through applying all that training with the pressure of a live uh, explosive? Well, as I mentioned, it's only the team leader that really encounters the IED or should encounter the idea uh, until it's 
done we, until we do an RSP or render safe procedure. Um, so the very first time I was face to face with a live IED was in Afghanistan as a team leader. And uh, <laughs> I gotta tell you, there was some nervous energy. But by that time, I just had been we'd trained and drilled over and over again. And some some of these, for better or worse, we had the our uh, Afghan National Army and Afghan National Police counterparts who would uh, uh, very helpfully dig it up, pull it out of the ground and just carry it right to us. <laughs> so uh, I, I could remember more than one time I would just say, okay, just set it down and let me just step away. Let me take care of it from here. And like, what? It's okay. I just ripped the thing apart. You're all right. Um, <laughs> but uh, that was, that was, that was that's how uh, I, I can't, and frankly, I can't remember the very first one. You know, just they all kind of blend together. Yeah. But without getting into the one, you know, kind of the last one, I would say that that really uh, obviously does the damage. Are there one or two that you remember being very complex, whether it's, you know, a fluid battlefield or just a very complex device itself that you had to encounter and, and negotiate? The only complexity I ran into in Afghanistan was when I encountered multiple IDs in one location and you they may be rigged with booby traps, but they were still very rudimentary. The the most difficult thing was detecting them in time. Because like I said, um they were almost always a one of one of those vegetable oil jugs full of uh, homemade explosive. They have a little blasting cap and a dead cord or something. And it was attached to a nine volt battery, some lamp cord and a, a pressure plate made out of two pieces of plywood. And what they would do is they, the, the, the Afghan insurgents had no idea what kind of magic wand we were waving over top of the dirt to find these things, but they did figure out that it was um, the batteries that we were detecting. They didn't know how or why, what magic could see the battery under the ground, but they realized that they could um, ferrolead. They could take a little extra cord and run the, the battery, these nine volt batteries around a corner just off to the side of the road. And then the oil jug and the pressure plates were invisible. Of course, there have been times where they buried a, uh, a couple of Chinese 80 millimeter mortars that are made out of iron <laughs> right underneath the pressure plate and then sent the battery around the corner. That was silly. But uh, <laughs> is that silly did... because the iron can be detected by the device, obviously, that we have? Yes. They... Yeah. Yes, and you can just go just further proof that they didn't understand what they were doing. They just found that it was more effective to put the battery somewhere else. So uh, it never never got too complex. And never uh, in the entire time I was there, I ran one uh, radio frequency RFID um, electronic you know, remote controlled. IED uh, that was shut down by our um, crew system. Okay. Wow. <clears throat> it, and then Aaron, could you take us to the, the blast that brings us to where we are here today with, with obviously the injuries that you, you s faced? Yeah. So uh, I'd, I'd been, in Afghanistan, uh, second time deploying to Afghanistan, first time as a 
team leader. We were running all these IEDs and, and uh, about eight months into the, the deployment, my my turn uh, came up for the two weeks of R&R, you know, leave back to stateside. So I flew back home, um, uh, went to DC to visit some family. We had a, a family reunion. I got to see my firstborn turn one. Uh, got to witness the whole family get together for Thanksgiving. It was a, I call it the best you know, last page in the photo album. And even while I was there, uh, I learned that another team leader in my company had gotten injured. And I went to Walter Reed and I was the, the first one to see him out of the ICU. And I even got there before he got out. He came out of surgery. And I was asking, like, how is he? What happened? And of course, nobody would tell me privilege. They said, you can go wait for him in this room. He'll be wheeled out pretty soon. And I got into uh, his uh, hospital room and right on the chair, sitting next to the bed, there was a pile of, you know, sweatpants, sweatshirt, and one shoe. Didn't have to be a rocket science to figure that one out. And my buddy Kyle gets wheeled in and you could tell under the sheet that there's just one leg. And I don't know if it, you know, he's another one of those guys, happy-go-lucky dude, hilarious. And uh, probably still pretty doped up from the anesthesia. He comes out, he comes into the room and goes, hey, oh, dude, what are you doing here? And then oh. a moment you know, a moment later, he um, he whispers to me and goes, I think I kicked myself in the face. <laughs> but the worst <laughs> thing, the worst thing he could come up with about the situation is that the blast had ruined a really gorgeous calf tattoo. Uh, so, um, I that stuck with me. But um, a few days later, I was heading back to finish out you know, my time in Afghanistan, and it wasn't you know it takes it takes you know a few days to get all the way back to your AO. But my team picked me up in you know my armored truck, our tr team truck, now driving back in a convoy heading towards you know Sea of Choi, when the convoy commander, you know the, the patrol leader, calls back and says, "EOD, there's something up in the road. Um, you know, can you take a look?" I'm sure. I threw the luggage off of the robot, threw the robot out, and we went and took a look. Of course. Same thing, oil jug and pressure plate. Um, there were a couple of weird things about this situation. Um, it was found by the Afghan National Police. Never really, I mean, like, who knows? But these, these, like the military, U.S. military, the Afghan National Army, you know, they get recruits from all over the country and they send them to wherever else in the country. The police, they're like local. So their cousin could be working for the Taliban. They could be working for the Taliban. I don't know. But uh, never really trusted them all that much. And um, there, when I got there, uh, before we even sending the robot out, there's, like, I asked for, like, pointed out the fattest dude, like, where's the chief? You, you're the chief, aren't you? Yeah. <laughs> um, and... I said, hey, where's the ID? And he threw the turp. He points at his whole group of guys just standing around. He says, right there. And in Afghanistan, when, you know, encountering a situation where everybody's standing right on top of the IED, I, I, I would say, you know, okay, I'm about to start EOD um, operations. I need everybody to clear out of here. And usually that for the Afghan means take about three steps back and then pull out the phone because this is going to be really cool to, pick, to take a picture. And this time it was like ninja pop smoke, right? I told the chief 
you know, the, the captain of this group to get everybody out of the way and they disappeared. They were gone. Like that was weird. Um, so I sent the robot. The robot pulled out the uh the the pressure plate and separated the components, but it couldn't get the the, the jug out of the hard packed earth. And you know, I want, if I could do it safely, I wanted to get as much evidence as I could. So I jumped out, did not have the bomb suit on because the the rule is on a uh, first approach of an unknown item, it should be with a robot or in the bomb suit. And I did that. I satisfied that and I separated the components. So there were, the, the, the known hazard was ha handled more or less. So it wasn't necessary to get in the bomb suit. And it would have been overkill if every time I didn't know, you know, every time I just got in the bomb suit. Um, <clears throat> so uh, I was in my standard battle rattle body armor. I had a, a, a metal detector in one hand. I had um, my evidence kit in the other and I started walking towards the device. And about 20 or 30 meters from the original device, there was a secondary that hadn't yet been found. Uh, just as my metal detector was trying to tell me something very important, I get the mule kick from hell. And I get punted into the air and I landed on my knees and elbows and I was still conscious. I don't know how lucid I was, but the lights had gone out. And I thought... You know, my, my helmet had just been pushed over my face from the force of the blast. The first thing I needed to do was wiggle. I did like the functions check, wiggle the fingers and the toes and, and elbows, knees, and make sure everything was there. And everything seemed to be intact. So I went to fix my helmet and just to find out that the helmet was gone. And that's when I thought to myself, oh, no. This is really bad. My first sergeant's going to kill me for losing that. Oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm actually not kidding about that. Um, it's funny now, but what goes through your head at certain times. Yeah. But I also realized that I had take, definitely taken damage because I couldn't, couldn't see. Um, I knew my team was going to be, you know, just standard operating procedure they were going to clear a safe path to the down team leader and just so the medics could get me out and since i was still more or less ambulatory i stood up and i started doing my first zombie walk back towards my the safe area and my team the only problem was i had no idea where the safe area was anymore and i was just walking around the battlefield kind of you know wow in a, in a you know a punch drunk stupor and my team grabbed me dragged me back to the safe area the medics started uh cutting yeah you know, my pants open to see what was bleeding um and within 14 minutes you know i wasn't very far from kandahar you know medevac chopper was touching down and loading me up and i was heading right back to the airfield um the blast I had mentioned before had taken my eyes and blown out my eardrums, but I could still hear. And the the concussion came from my right side because my my cheek bones had been crushed and had been pressed up. Um, the orbital bone in my skull had been misshapen, um, and of course, I was leaking spinal fluid. But uh, was virtually untouched from my neck down. No idea how that happened. Uh, we hail boys have pretty thick skulls, so I don't think I could have been hit in a better place. But um, yeah, I was uh, as a uh, medevac back to Kandahar, and then uh, to Landstool. I waited about twenty four hours there. Uh, because they were worried about uh, swelling and pressure in my brain and they didn't want me to risk you know that high altitude um, transatlantic flight so 
Within 48 hours, though, I was at Walter Reed, right back where I just visited my my buddy and fellow team leader, uh, Kyle, was just down down the hall from him. Um, and I was blind. I have a lot of questions. Uh, thank you for sharing that. It's just, um, I think the first question that I have, it, the way you described your R and R, felt a lot like mine three years prior. So I came back from Afghanistan. I went to my oldest son's first birthday party, saw family, and went back into like you know aviation combat operations. Mm -hmm. um, Shortly after getting back, we got in a pretty heated engagement and I thought I was going to die. And in my head, I was just thinking about my kid. What was going through your head after that blast? Um, I, I don't know. Like I've never sustained a blast like that. I, I cannot imagine. But what types of things come to mind beyond losing your, your sensitive item, which I understand? <laughs> yeah. You know the the first answer that comes to mind is the the blast wave <laughs> uh what's going through your mind yes, is over yes. over pressure um uh, but uh literally the first thing that i thought of was situational awareness i can remember uh the blast happening thinking i'd just been blown up and then it was, is this going to be a complex ambush? What what will happen next? So my team, and it was literally thinking my team is going to be focused on me. I hope the security cordon is not also just focused on me. And that's what I was thinking about. And and then, um, of course, I was not silly. So, so I get on the... Um, uh, medevac chopper and they're trying to put an IV on me and the last thing I remember for before passing out was them taking that you know one of those uh really cool um uh watches you know the big watches with the compass and the, yep uh, I'm like don't lose that you know <laughs> uh um but then I passed out I woke up for a a minute in Kandahar to you know, my sergeant major, my command sergeant major, uh, you know, you know Staff Sergeant Hale, this is your sergeant major. No, uh, yes, yeah, sergeant major. Are you telling me you you telling me that you got blown up and then you got up and walked off the battlefield? <laughs> yes, sergeant major. You are fucking crazy. <laughs> yes, sergeant major. And then I passed out again. That's that's what I remember. And so it, it wasn't until I mean, I literally the, the, the whole the whole thing, the, the entire process, land stool, it was just a kind of a whirlwind. I um doctors and nurses and uh the, okay, you're gonna get wheeled out to um the airfield and you know for the, the air flight. Uh, across the Atlantic. Oh, by the way, do you want to you want to meet um, uh, Tom Cruise? What? I know I've got some TBI, but that just sounds <laughs> like you're messing with me. And, you, and the nurse goes, "Oh no, he's uh, promoting. He's he's touring around Europe promoting uh, his latest Mission Impossible, and he just came by to you know say hi to the troops." I'm like, that is so weird. <laughs> so as i'm getting wheeled out in the gurney to the you know the airfield laying and laying in this thing uh, tom cruise who i know my eardrums were bl blown out but it sounded like he was like face to face with me um <laughs> but uh he um he shook my hand and thanked me for my service and then i got on the plane and i'm like that was the weirdest thing um, it is odd <laughs> It wasn't until, and even even at Walter Reed, for days, it was just one thing after another. Uh, and then I finally you know, just started thinking about what was going to go, what was going to happen. But it didn't, it didn't really sink in that I was going to be blind for the rest of my life for, for days. I thought maybe um, they, could, they could repair the damage 
maybe it was like a detached retina or something um my my right eyeball was gone in fact uh my eyelids had been fused like like burned like melted together so i had like this permanent wink and oh. but there was there was no no eye inside um but uh uh i just like i remember sitting there and thinking uh oh my like, like, like i'm never gonna be i'm never gonna get to do eod again I'm never gonna do my job i just i love this thing i love this this community um i can't i can't be you know the the, the, the kind of man i want to be i can't be a husband now i can't be a father to my son these all these you know demons it, i call them the voice in the back of your head only saying what if this had gone differently or you know why me and, and uh it's that that um self-defeating talk it's just a spiral into depression and i did realize that it was leading me nowhere it was just it was leading me in totally wrong direction and that was when kyle uh wheeled himself in it'd be, he'd been there for a couple of weeks now and um i remember the first thing he did he's like hey dude give me your hand I'm like why and he takes my hand palm up and slaps it under his chin right and and i feel this scruff two weeks of growth and he goes you know there's there's a bunch of marine eod techs here from the Helmand province they have this attache or counselor guy as soon as they get out of surgery they he asks all the marine eod techs how are you doing and if they say i'm okay he hands him a razor and says get back into regs dude we don't have that attache in the army here grow your beard out it's driving him crazy <laughs> and that was it man you know the jokes he was telling it just kind of pulled me out of my my myself depression and i realized that um i don't i didn't have a monopoly on pain right what i was going through is going to suck a lot but there were all these warriors up and down the halls that were going through their own personal battles and who was i to give up you know who was i wanted to, to say mine was the the worst pain and i have the best excuse for not doing my best and that's 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 when i decided that if i was going to be blind i was going to be the best damn blind guy i could be and i'm going to master this blindness thing and when they asked me where do you want to retire i said i don't i over the, <laughs> the, the over the few weeks that i'd been there i'd actually learned that there were a few uh active duty blind active duty soldiers uh captain scott smiley took over one of those uh warrior transition courses or warrior, warrior transition units um out in washington there was a uh, uh, army ranger ivan castro who went to the special operations recruiting branch at fort bragg there were these they were blind and they were still wearing the uniform I'm like i could do that so what do you want to do send me back to the schoolhouse i'll be an instructor i mean i'm not going to be on the demo range probably but <laughs> i could definitely teach so um you know, after I got out of, you know, all of my training, it was months of, um, you know, the hospitals and, and surgeries and all that. That's what I did. But the thing is, is that instead of saying I can't, which shuts everything off, it, it, it closes the door, it closes, the, you know, shuts the drapes on creativity, imagination, possibilities, opportunity. I can't just says no. I just started asking, how can I? What is possible? And it was so funny. Um, I only sp I spent about five weeks or so at Walter Reed. Once the, the facial surgeries and all that were over, there's not much for me there. 
you can't really do much for me. So um, I went to the VA hospital in Augusta, Georgia. And that's where they have one of the, uh, the many VA blind rehabilitation centers all around the country. And this did blind school for the veterans. And um, I was actually there at the same time as Brad Snyder, who fellow uh, EOD tech, Navy uh, officer who was injured, he was blinded uh, about six months before me. And as soon as he got out of his you know, blind school a few months before me, he went on to win like three medals at the London Paralympics. He's now been to the Olympics like three times and he's just crushing it. And man, I couldn't let him show me up. <laughs> but uh, anyway, everything, everything in EOD is a competition. It was so funny. I remember you know, in processing and out processing, they have the same set of different types of uh, little tests to see if you progressed or how much help you need. And one of them, you have, it's like building blocks, but they're all these different shapes and, and sizes. And there may be 30 of them, but the, 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 the test is to, you got to stack one on top of the other, but before you put the next one on, you have to let it go and it has to stand up. And depending on the number of the, the, the blocks you can stand on, on, on end, um, it means you need, uh, very little help, some help, or you need a lot of assistance. It's just manual skills. So I got to like 21 and, um, or I don't know. And the first thing I did when I saw Brad, I was like, how many do you get? <laughs> and he's like, oh, I don't know. But then when he, he graduated before me, he comes by and goes, I got 23. I'm like, oh, man, I'm so going to, I'm so going to get better than 23 when I get out process. But I mean, that's, <laughs> it, it, it was, how can I do this? And, and as I, I learned how to be blind, you learn to use the cane and the talking um, computers and, and phones and, and just learn how to be a blind person. Um, then it was like, what next? And it was so funny because I didn't even realize this was a thing, but a, rec a guy named Eric uh, came into the room and he said, he's a, a um, uh, recreational therapist. Really? That's well, cool. <laughs> and you say, hey, uh, you want to go golfing? Oh, come on. You're messing with me. No, blind golf is a serious sport. In fact, blind golfers take their golf as seriously as sighted golfers. Uh, and then one day he comes in and goes, hey, you want to go for a bike ride? I'm like, come, no, no, no. I know you're messing with me. No, tandem cycling another Paralympic sport and also very, very competitive. And um, what he, he said, there was a local, local bike shop in, um, in Augusta and the, the, the shop owner has a tandem every Saturday morning. They do like a group ride. And so every Saturday while I was at blind school, I was doing like 30, 32, 33 uh, miles on a, uh, on a tandem, tandem cycle around Augusta. It, it was, it was, wow. it was awesome. And I started running and, and I mean, I just, you know, there were a lot of things that I was trying out then that you know, nobody, nobody told me I couldn't do. Um, I started learning about blind guys that were doing uh, amazing things, blind people that were, you know, Eric Weinmayer, who's the first blind person to climb Mount Everest. So I sought him out and I climbed a mountain with him. And then Lonnie oh, Bedwell. Lonnie Bedwell is the first blind uh, person to kayak the entire Grand Canyon in a solo kayak. And I sought him out and I went kayaking with him. And it just, oh, it was that Ivan Castro, the ranger guy, he's a big time runner, right? So I was on a call with him once and he said every year he makes it a point to run the Air Force marathon the army 10 miler and the marine corps marathon i thought oh that's, that sounds cool so patriotic i'll do the same thing so i registered for those three races and then somebody 
you know, I'm here in, in like the Eglin area in the Florida Panhandle and something said, you, you need to do something local. So I registered for the Pensacola Marathon. And I don't even know how I got talked into this, but a nonprofit I'd never heard of uh, said they'd pay my way if I wanted to go run the San Antonio Rock and Roll Marathon. I'm like, sure. So all of a sudden I was registered for four marathons and a 10 miler within a four month span. And I'd never run anything longer than a 10 K. <laughs> so, so um i just started you know part of it was this complete terror of being stuck in my with my condition right stuck indoors sitting on the couch feeling sorry for me dominated by those those demons maybe jumping into a bottle or uh, popping pills for the rest of my life so I had to get out there and I, I just, I just kept doing it. Man, this is probably the most inspirational thing I've ever heard. Uh, a couple <laughs> questions for you, Aaron. One is within EOD, is there just an expectation that your time will come at some point? And the reason I ask is in army aviation, there's a saying of, uh, it's not, it's not if, but when you're going to have your accident, like you just realize as a pilot, at some point, you're going to have an accident, but our accidents aren't always catastrophic, of course. What is the mindset within EOD in terms of when this might happen to you? I don't think so. I mean, we've all been maybe a little too close to the bang from time to time. Um, but... I mean, they would definitely have take the sardonic, sardonic jokes to a new level. <laughs> um, but uh, we're always, uh, you know, we have one of the most hazardous jobs in the world. So we have to be the most safe. So we don't, we don't even, we don't, we don't say see you later. We don't say goodbye. We say stay safe. That's our that's our goodbye. Stay safe. Um, we stick very close. I mean, there are, you know how there are specialty Facebook groups. I think there are four thousand EOD team. You know, EOD <laughs> members, EOD. Uh, you know, EOD techs and spouses in the EOD chefs Facebook group. <laughs> uh just because it's smoking and grilling and cooking and whatever everybody's in there everybody loves it uh but that's we stick together and and we don't there's not a i don't know i don't think there's a fatalism to it it's like a group of alpha nerds right always studying you know, ordinance always studying ieds tactics and you know the ttps and all of that we're nerdy about it and no i don't think there's a fatalism yeah. to it Make, makes sense is there any do you carry any animosity for the enemy in this case it's easy for me to have come back without you know physical scars but do you help hold any animosity for that enemy i don't waste space I don't waste space, energy, or time on that. I, I mean, it doesn't, I don't understand the other side. I don't understand, um, you know, how they can believe what they believe. But it's not my job to understand. It was my job to go take care of the explosive hazards on the battlefield. Now I'm home. I've got, you know, my family. I've got a couple of businesses. I've got my fellow, you know, service members and and you know, veterans that I feel responsible to. I've got I've got way too much on my plate to you know waste any energy on on hatred, animosity, or any of that kind of stuff. Do I do I miss my eyesight? You betcha. Um, do I wish it hadn't have happened? I don't know. I mean, of course, I would love to have my eyesight back. But when they took my eyesight, I was given a whole different life. And I love it. 
I mean, I love my life. Are there frustrating times? Sure. But everybody's got frustrating times. Wow. How about that moment? I mean, when you were sharing this story about making the decision to go EOD, I mean, I cannot imagine a more pivotal fork in the road for someone's life than your decision to go down that road. EOD, do you ever look back and regret that decision? Navy cook to army bomb squad. I tell people I, I got my first confirmed kill with an eclair and then decided to start saving lives instead. Uh, but uh, do I regret? No. Oh, like I said, I joined a family. I mean, I joined a way of life. And uh, I wouldn't give that up for the, the world. And the good work my team and I uh, did on the battlefield, I might have, you know, it might have been a trait of my eyeballs and my hearing. But for how many lives saved? I don't know, but it was worth it. Um, you mentioned uh, that you've started a few businesses. So just for those out there who who don't already feel like they're not doing enough, I'd like to touch on some of these, right? So maybe we could start with Extraordinary Delights. Could you, could you share the inspiration? What is it and the inspiration behind it? Oh, yeah. Well, um, you know, I was, like I, I mentioned, I was, I was climbing mountains and kayaking and running marathons. Actually, I started running running just to get ready for the mountains since it's really hard to find a decent mountain to climb on, you know, to train on in Florida. But uh, <laughs> um, I... Um, it was uh, summer of 2015 when um, I was I was on the phone with my 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 girlfriend at the time, and I was just coming off the plane from a speaking event. I was feeling really uh, unusually fatigued, and then I got dizzy. It wasn't um, like your normal kind of dizzy. It was like vertigo, where the world just moves. And I was just I was standing there waiting for the earth that were a countertop to hit me in the face or something. And then it just stopped. I go, that was crazy. So I said, I'm going to lay down for a, just a nap. Maybe I need need some rest. And then I don't know how long it was uh, until I woke up with this like screaming headache. I mean, migraine doesn't doesn't do it justice. Uh, it was like somebody had poured acid right into my head. I downed a fistful of Tylenol or something, and the pain made me puke it right back up. And I called the uh, called nine one one. Of course, it was really funny when the nine one one operator asked me what the nature of the emergency was, and I said, "Ma'am, I've got a really bad headache." <laughs> <laughs> On a scale of one to ten, how bad is the pain? I said. Ma'am, um, I've never felt a pain like this in my life, and I've literally been blown up before. Uh, <laughs> she said the ambulance is on its way. <laughs> so, uh, four days later, I came out of this, I don't know, weird stupor. I don't remember. Um, but I was in the hospital. My girlfriend uh, was right by my side. And last time I remember I was talking to her and she was in California across the country. Like, wow, how'd you get here so fast? And my mom was there like, you came from Ohio. How did you get here so fast? I didn't realize it was four days later, wow. but it happened. Meningitis, bacterial meningitis had snuck into my head and was trying to kill me. They started pumping me full of heavy doses of antibiotics but um, everyone was trying to talk to me and it was like I was underwater and it felt very congested. Uh, and the, the uh, bacteria was destroying what was left of my hearing that the, um, uh, that the, the blast hadn't taken. 
I was in the hospital for a few weeks and then they sent me home and I'd also lost my vestibular balance, that inner ear balance. And, and I get, so I went home in a wheelchair and, and it was, it was like, I, I couldn't hear, I couldn't see, and I couldn't even sit on the toilet without falling off. I definitely couldn't get on my treadmill and work out. So all I did for, I don't know how long, I was sitting at my, my breakfast bar, you know, an encounter in my kitchen. And again, I was feeling sorry for myself. I'm like, when is enough enough? When is one guy paid his dues? You know, when is this uh, soldier given enough? And I tell you what, you know, everybody who complained about uh feeling isolated during the covid lockdowns i feel your pain <laughs> i was i was there i was isolated there might have been people all around me but i had no idea until they touched me or oh, i could feel the tremor like the footsteps from the, the wow. ground uh it was silent oh hello my, my girlfriend my wife um was writing every letter of every word in you know capital block letters because i'm a soldier right uh it, <laughs> that she needed to say to me in the palm of my hand and that's how i got messages in of course i thought at the time man i should have learned braille at uh, the blind school yeah. but with all with all that tech you know it's a dying art just you need to be able to hear with the tech <laughs> but it was you know it was that that you know, juncture, right? Feeling sorry for myself. And I, for like four years, I've been doing all this stuff. And I was, I was speaking and I was getting hired actually to go speak and be inspirational and talk about this, you know, triumph over tragedy. Yeah. And success over struggle. And here I was, forced to put my money where my mouth was right and i thought i can't i can't just give up because things got hard again i love how uh general mattis put it in call sign chaos when he said at least in the the marines things being hard was never a good excuse for mission failure and they just kept popping up in my head yeah so it's hard you still have a mission. So I did what anybody would do in my situation. And I started a fudge company. A uh, natural next step for anyone. Um, actually, it was it was the holidays. It were coming up. I was still uh, awaiting surgery. They actually did my other ear, but the, the blast damage on the right side, like I mentioned, was, was more extensive and it, it didn't take... That was really, really disappointing because I waited months for the surgery and then I had to wait till it healed. And then I had to go to the audiologist to get it tuned in. And I thought, okay, now uh, I can hear again. And no. And then I had to wait again to go get the other surgery and wait till the surgical site healed and then get the other implant tuned in until it was taking so long. So while I was waiting, yeah, the holidays were coming. I decided, all right, I'm not, I'm going to do something to take, take my mind off of this. I don't want to think about myself and what I was going through. I'm just going to turn it around on Thanksgiving. We're going to invite the whole family from all over the country, we invite some neighbors. Uh, we even adopted a few, uh, the, the EOD students that you know young guys they, they don't have the leave days the money saved up for yeah. uh, you know like like thanksgiving because they're saving up for the, the the winter exodus and so there's just they're like the, the base shuts down but there's still people you know young guys just hanging out in the barracks doing nothing so we invited four or five eod students and we just had this huge feast and I started preparing weeks in advance a couple of turkeys one in the smoker one in the oven ham yeah all I turned every vegetable I could think of into something unhealthy I started cooking uh 
uh, desserts way in advance. And I would just, I would just make cakes and cookies and pies. I started making batch after batch of fudge and I would do one batch and I'd set it aside. And then I would do another one and tweak the recipe a little bit and set it aside. And then I would, I was like, like you know, maybe a little spice and a little chopped nuts. And then I'd go to the liquor cabinet and dump it a little, dump a little in my mouth and then a little bit more in there. And I was just having fun. And in fact, my Michaela, my wife, um, mentioned she saw two things one um was a smile on my face that she hadn't seen in like half a year and two the fudge was just piling up <laughs> so she started sneaking it out the uh, the front door like got to be real stealthy around a blind deaf guy um and giving it away and people started coming back friends neighbors just said we've got a birthday party or you know, bar mitzvah or something and we want want to buy some from you and the capitalist in me said well of course you may and before we knew it we we started a fudge business it was pretty funny i uh started i, I turned my garage earlier into a, a really awesome man cave gym the, if you can imagine, then I had a treadmill, stationary bike, rower, and then a shrink wrap machine for the boxes of fudge. <laughs> and that's how we got started. And then just <clears throat> before we started recording, you had mentioned like the proceeds from that or the profits go into another business that you have. So, yes, what I mean. Uh, maybe maybe just one question before that. If people are going to go onto the website and buy some of this, what's the what's the one type of fudge you say you got to have this one? Oh well, it, there are a few flavors that are pretty standard, but there's one that uh, I'm particularly proud of, and it's uh, American pick me up, and it's uh, it's okay. it's an all American version of tiramisu from Italy. And the reason being, uh, tiramisu literally translated means pick me up, tirare mi su, and pick me up. Because it's got coffee and alcohol and co you know, uh, cocoa and all that good stuff. So um, what I did was I made an all-American version with two layers, a uh, white chocolate layer with bourbon cream instead of frangelico or amaretto and then instead of yeah hazelnuts i did georgia toasted georgia pecans on top and then the bottom layer is a darker chocolate and instead of espresso we actually used coffee from found, found a roaster american pride roast, roasters so literally an all-american tiramisu it's cool. american pick me up love it all right great and then and then it's doing so well, you can use it to start a completely separate business. And I just wanted to touch on that too. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, it started taking off. We got featured on Fox Business with Liz Clayman. We were uh, even not long ago invited on to Rachel Ray and the, the business was taking off. It was doing really wow. well. And uh, we started having the freedom from becoming entrepreneurs, business owners, to really chase some some other passions, and we wanted to develop some some generational freedom by investing in real estate. So we we bought some fixer rubbers, and it was really funny. Like the very first time we decided we were going to buy, uh, did like the most difficult thing you could possibly could as a blind deaf guy: It'd start out of state, buy an online auction fixer rubber, and turn into a rental. And it turned out just like you would think it would. <laughs> Everything. It was all the estimates were off. A good um, learning experience, no doubt. Yeah, it was it was a real estate university one on one. Um, but thankfully the market was with us too. But we had some great team members um you know, uh, you know working working with us and working for us. And we turned it into some of our estimates were off on the low side, not just the rehab budget, but the rental, uh, you know, the rental um, 
uh, afterwards and the after renovation value. And we did a cash out refinance and took all that money that we just put into it, paid back our private money lender. And then with the rest of it, we went and bought a duplex and another uh, single family. We turned the single family into a short-term rental, an Airbnb. That started cash flowing great. We did that again on the same street. And then we started investing here in the Florida area. And um, it was we were doing so well that I thought, you know what, I'll bring on uh, a partner to help locally with some of it. And I actually uh, partnered with a uh, good friend of mine I met on my first deployment in the Navy. We deployed to Afghanistan the first time. Danny and I uh, do um, flick, fix and flips, uh, invest in uh, the Pensacola area. So we've got a couple of different channels. We we use mostly private money lender, you know, private investors, and we find them double digit returns in any market. And then we refinance out of those short term loans, return it to return money with interest to our lenders, and then we hold on to some of them. We sell some of them, and it's it's so much fun, and everybody. Everybody wins when it's done right. Okay. So uh, we, we've we covered a lot of ground. I took you way longer than I said. I am beyond appreciative, Aaron, for this. Um, there's a few questions I ask everybody before we wrap up, and I just want to ask you these two as well. Uh, one of them is, was there anything that you carried with you when you were downrange that had sentimental value, something that somebody gave you or a good luck charm that you just wanted to have on you? Mm -hmm. I don't know. I'm never, ever really a, like a sentimental type like that or superstitious, I guess. Um, my favorite thing downrange was a picture of my son. That was my motivation. I mean, it just uh, was right there in my, uh, you know, my troop kit, my, my tough box. I mean, that's the, the, the only thing that really meant anything when I was on deployment. Um, of sentimental value. And I know we, um, we kind of touched on this point, but I always ask people knowing what you know now, would you go back and do it again? That's a impossible question to answer. I would give anything to be able to see my now three boys and my wife and my my mom and my dad, my brother and my sister, to see them for one more day. But I've become such a better human, a better version of myself since then. I don't know if I could give that up. Um, and you have the podcast, the Point of Im Impact podcast, which uh, is, is about inspiring people and and sharing these great stories. So people need to check it out. And I don't know how good the technology is on your side, Aaron, if it can tell that I've been tearing up over here. Um, I have not done that before. Not like this. So uh, thank you for everything that you shared with us, man. It meant a ton to me. Well, um, thank you for having me on. This is a great conversation. I really appreciate the chance to, to speak with you. And I've been tearing up too, but you know, we spoke about that. <laughs> <laughs> Fair point. Thank you so much, Aaron. Best of luck. Stay safe, man. Same to you, Ryan. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed that combat story. That one meant a ton to me. I've got a couple comments I wanted to share. Uh, one very appropriate, I think, for this episode. First one, however, is from a uh, YouTube subscriber on YouTube, and it's from Vanguard W. And it's in it's uh, about the Farat Batman interviews, parts one and two. That's episodes 54 and 55. And for those who don't recall, Farat was a uh, just an amazing human who got up and left his comfortable life in Europe to go fight in Syria against ISIS. And I mean, it's such a great story. The comedy that goes on, the uh, bravery, the courage, the brotherhood, uh, all of the above are just amazing. Uh, but the comment here from Vanguard W was, these two parts of the episode are criminally underviewed. Such a fantastic interview. It's perplexing. This isn't way higher for views. And I, I would tend to agree with you. And I obviously don't worry too much about what we see for views. 
interviews with the only caveat being I want people, I want more people to hear the stories that these warriors tell. And these two are great ones. So if you may have overlooked them just because, hey, Farhat's not a uh, US Army or just an American citizen fighting in your standard, um, more traditional combat zones, it is it is well worth a listen. Just the, um, the pipeline to get into battle, um, how he had to get there, the family ties, the uh, revenge, the feeling of uh, what ISIS took from him and his family and giving it back, just really impressive. So thank you very much for leaving that and for subscribing. The uh, second comment was a five-star review that we got on Apple Podcast, and it's a bit longer, so if you'll bear with me. I thought it was appropriate, especially given this episode we just had, and I'll share why afterwards. This is from Mario R. Martinez, and he says, I'm bursting with American pride. I just listened to the interview with Mr. Jose Rodriguez, and for those who don't recall or haven't seen it, that's our interview with a CIA legend. And he says, I'm an American citizen born in Honduras. After this episode, I was bursting with Hispanic and American pride. Thanks to both of you for your service. That was only the second episode I had listened to. I then did something I never do. I read the comments. After reading a vitriolic comment, I responded with the following. If you are in America or lived here for any amount of time, you should be grateful to these people for making the difficult choices and taking the increasingly challenging steps to assure your right to disagree with them without fear that men with guns might come to your home and disappear you in the middle of the night. So stand in judgment and be self-righteous. They put their lives on the line so you could do so in peace. Every American or person living here should recognize that our freedom and the peace we enjoy at home was created by men and women such as these. They are those who hold the evil at bay, which seeks your destruction because of the freedom you enjoy. And I just thought it was so, so well put, so eloquent. Um, and he said, I had to write this review in support of your podcast. Thanks for letting those of us who haven't served have a peek behind the curtain, which is a phrase that I had used at the outset. Um, Jose Rodriguez was a trailblazer um, at the agency. He did a lot of the work that he was later blamed for that was fully approved by the politicians that we served. And he did so to protect people like me later on. And he did. And he, took, he paid the price for it in a lot of hateful feelings and comments. And I hope if you listen to that, you get a different impression of this guy who is an absolute freedom fighter the same way any army soldier would have been. But the reason I say that is I anticipate uh, that this episode you just listened to with Aaron Hale, because he was a Navy chef, is going to get its own fair amount of vitriolic comments. People who just want to hate on him for not being a door kicker. And we spend time on that part of his life because it's what he wanted to do. And then after 9-11, he felt that he had to do more and he deliberately went down the path of being a bomb technician and it changed everything about his life. So I would just ask if you've listened this far, first of all, thank you very much. Take a look at the comments on YouTube and if you do see people getting out of line, please stand up for Aaron. Uh, I, I don't think he would ever ask for that, but I'm asking for it because it's important to me personally. So thank you all for listening, uh, for, for being longtime listeners, or maybe it's your first or second one like Mario here, but uh, I greatly appreciate it. And this phrase has a newfound, um, newfound importance for me. As I say to each of you, stay safe.